So, quick show of hands. How many of you owned one of these uh, phones in the course of your life? Most of you. Most of you. I've still got one. My wife moans about me keeping junk, but it was a great phone. But if, just think about this for a second. If I had asked you or told you on the day you'd unpacked that phone from its cellophane wrapping and got all chuffed about this great new piece of technology you had in your hands, that in the not too distant future, you'd be Ubering, you'd be taking selfies, you'd be posting them to Instagram and Facebook, you would have looked at me like I was a lunatic because none of those things existed when this phone was launched. We lived in a very, very different world, a very analog world where we had to carry discrete devices to do all sorts of different things in our lives. Today, it's all in the palm of our hands on a smartphone. And I would guess that most of you in this room will have a smartphone of one, one uh, type, whether it's running on Android or Apple, doesn't really matter. But that thing does for you everything and more that you see on the left-hand side of the picture. And you take for granted today all of these fa fabulous services that you're able to consume out of the cloud. You have no idea where they are. You typically don't know where your data is being stored, where those Facebook pictures are actually residing. You trust in the system to a large extent, and you use this stuff, and you become very, very uh, connected and able to, able to uh, participate in all sorts of activities that were very difficult to do in the past. So the, the upside is this wonderful opportunity to create a more inclusive society. But I loved the rap that Helen closed her presentation with because as someone said the other day, we've never been more connected and yet in many cases more alone than we are today. And we have to watch that uh, as we use this technology. So I wanna talk a little bit about digital transformation. I have the great privilege of working for a company called SAP. It's one of the global leaders in information technology. When I started, Back 22 years ago with this company, we had 2,000 odd people worldwide. Today we're 81,000 people. And we're right in the center of this notion of the digital economy. So I just wanna share a few thoughts with you about that, what we're doing and how we see things playing out. There is no doubt that we stand right in the middle of a massive inflection point for humanity. If you go back in history, the domestication of the ox and the development of the plow more or less destroyed the hunter-gatherer society as we moved into agrarian societies. The development of the Gutenberg press broke the stranglehold that the church and the Catholic priests had on knowledge and led to the Renaissance. Our ability to augment human power with steam and electricity led to the Industrial Revolution, drove a massive wave of urbanization and mass production and consumption that we all enjoy today. This digital inflection point that we are in right now, I don't think anybody can claim to know exactly how it's gonna pan out, but there is no doubt it's gonna change the world that we live in and change it massively. And change we have to, folks, because we're standing today at about 7.4 billion people on this little planet whizzing through space. We're at about 150% of capacity of the planet today. By 2050, we'll be 9 billion people. By the end of the century, we'll be somewhere around 11 billion, 45% of which will live in Africa. So we've never lived in a time of more promise and more peril. And, and I like to think of digital technologies a little bit like the atom. You can use it to wreak great destruction or you can use it to do enormous good. The choice really is up to us. As uh, Philip said earlier on in his speech, it comes down to each one of us and how we choose to engage going forward. And I think the promise for Africa is that we can use this technology to leapfrog some of the old models of how we run organizations, how we run economies, how we run our societies, and do a lot better for the burgeoning and growing economy of, of our continent. It will be disruptive. This uh, study that came out at WEF earlier this year talked about a net loss of 5.1 million jobs and no one's quite sure what they're gonna be replaced with. But there's one thing for sure, we will need new jobs. There will be, be new careers that will be forged on the back of data, on the back of information technologies. And uh, if you've got young children, you know, my folks always try to guide me to be a chartered accountant. Came second on that one. But uh, you, you, it's very difficult, I guess, as a parent today to tell your kids what to do. 
Uh, all you can do is give them a great set of values, I guess, and set them on the right path. But for Africa, this is a really acute problem. Today, we are around 1.2 billion people, 16% of the world, 3% of the global economy. In a relatively short space of time, we're gonna more than double our population. In a continent that is gonna come under the whip of climate change, already greatly degraded uh, agricultural lands, we're gonna have to think about ways to dial in every single resource we have, human and physical, to make sure that people have a, a decent shot at life. And it's about change. The Industrial Revolution g gave us mass consumption, mass production, but it came with some very painful uh, experiences. And as you can see from that picture there, very young children working in very hazardous circumstances. That picture didn't really change for a long time in, in the mass production environment. It's always been about people putting things together until now. If you look at this picture of the BMW factory in the UK, you can't see a single person there and yet these cars are moving off the end of that production line roughly every couple of minutes. But of course there's still people there. They're building the robots, they're programming the robots, they're using science to figure out how to or orchestrate the supply chain so that the right part arrives at the right place in the, uh, in the production line in order for that thing to flow almost like a river. So it will be about new skills, and I guess if you're in learning and development, you have to be thinking about what is that gonna do to your company and to your job and to the people that you are enabling in the world you live in. And you have to come to grips with technology. If we wanna move from the picture that's just gone off your screen there to the, to the, the new world that we're moving into, this world of, of much uh, better sustainability, better use of resources, the sharing economy and the like, all of these technologies that I'm not gonna drill into today uh, will have to come together in your world, in your organization's world, in order to create new value, in order to create new engagements of customers, of your workforce, and of anybody else who's involved in the way you create value. And the things you have to think about are this hyper-connectivity, first and foremost. Everything is connected. People in social networks and things increasingly in, in the internet of things. Today there's about 15, million, uh, 15 billion devices connected to the internet. By 2020, if, if the exponential growth continues the way it is, that's likely to be somewhere around 200 billion devices. The kind of things that the previous speakers were talking about that are plugged into your brain waves, into your body, your fridge, your car, each light in your house. We have enough IP addresses, folks, to put a sensor on every atom on earth and still do another 100 earths. So we're not gonna run out of capacity to gather data. What we may run out of capacity to do is how to use that data. And it is gonna be all about data. We already have algorithms out there that can predict two or three days before you become clinically depressed that you are about to become depressed based on your movement patterns, based on your interactions on social media and email and the like. So we, if we can get the data and ask it the right questions, we can find some phenomenal new uh, insights into what's going on in ourselves and in the world around us. And we often forget this. As you sit there in that chair right now with your smartphone, your, your telco and your social networks and any other apps you're using where you haven't turned off the, the privacy features knows exactly where you are. They know what route you took to get into that chair. They know whether you're fidgeting in that chair. They know what the ambient light looks like in this room. They know who's sitting next to you. All of that data is there. And that raises, of course, some very interesting questions around how we deal with the ethics and privacy of this information. Every time you do something on a social network, you reveal a little bit more about who you are. Every time you ask a question on Google, Google knows what you're interested in. And if it can figure that out and there's enough people like you, then it obviously it can start to target you with some very clever advertising. And of course, the dark side of that is the surveillance piece. You know, people watching our every move and understanding, you know, what we might do next uh, and taking s uh, steps to circumvent that. So it's an interesting world. It is a world that's moving towards robots and algorithms. China, it was mentioned earlier, I, I forget who, who mentioned it, 40% of their graduates are engineers. They lost 20 million jobs out of their economy, not to Vietnam or to India, but to robots. 
So more and more of this production stuff, this hard mundane, mundane humdrum work is moving to be automated. And there's a company in Hong Kong that has appointed an algorithm on its board of director. Simply because, as neuroscience tells us, this little piece of gray matter in here can only hold somewhere around five to seven facts and synthesize those to make a decision. Beyond that, it lets go and it just can't cope. The average doctor today has to deal with around 100 facts when they, when they diagnose you if, you if you're a cancer patient or an Alzheimer's patient. There's too much data for the human brain to actually absorb, so we have to use uh, computing power to do that and then uh, oversee the decisions that our computers are making. The other point you have to bear in mind, folks, is you don't have a lot of time to do this. It's happening very, very fast. Our company, which uh, today accounts for around 76% of all the trade that happens in the world, took 39 years to get to a market capital of $63 billion. Uber did more than that in five and a half years. When you take an idea, you put it on a global network, you make it fun to engage with, it's useful to people, it explodes. And it explodes very, very fast. And one of the things you have to do as learning and development people is get the people in your company thinking about that. Because if they're not, if they think tomorrow is just gonna be an extension of today, your organization's gonna fail sooner rather than later. And here's a wonderful case study of that. Blockbuster were offered the opportunity to buy Netflix for 50 million US dollars. They looked at it and said, Puh, tiny little startup, it's never gonna go anywhere. It's a different business model, we don't understand it go away and uh, the rest is history there came a pivotal moment in technology where we could start to stream video and today that massive organization uh, blockbuster is no more and that tiny little startup is a 45 billion us dollar organization in literally the blink of an eye you cannot waste time you have to start moving you have to start moving very very quickly and in many cases you have to start unlearning all the things that we got taught about how you build a business. Because in this dematerialized world of data and digits, a lot of that stuff doesn't count anymore. The old restrictions don't apply. It's not about access to capital and resources today. It's about access to data and ideas. That's what will make a successful organizations. And Alvin Toffler said it really, really well when he said that the illiterate of this century are not gonna be those who can't read or write, and there's still too many of them in the world, but it's actually gonna be the people who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. That's the critical thing you have to drive in your organization. And you have gotta get it done fast. It's very sobering, is it not, to look at that first fact on the top right-hand side of the screen there. Just think about that for a second. Fortune 500 companies, with lots of people like you to drive learning and development, the ability to attract the top talents from the Stanfords and the Harvard universities of the world, the money to spend on research and development, and still they tank. Often because they're arrogant and often because they have linear thinking. They think tomorrow will just be more of the same and it's not gonna be like that anymore. So we're living in a time of amazing digital Darwinism. We know we can't solve tomorrow's problems, as Einstein said, using the thinking that created them in the first place. And that's what led me to think about what's the one idea I would like to leave you with uh, as a result of this presentation. Because you have a lot on your plates. Many, many, many different concepts. I learned some new terminology from Philip today about knowledge hives and, and things like that that I hadn't uh, heard before. But you have a lot on your plates, but what you need to think about very carefully is, are these things just a faster, amplified way of doing the past? Or are they genuinely new and disruptive? Because you have to be thinking about disruption in your world. And when I thought about that, I thought about how have we done it. You know, it, SAP recently launched a, a new computing platform that puts us four to five years ahead of anybody else in the industry, and it's allowing us to disrupt uh, all sorts of industries uh, and to use data in all sorts of fascinating new ways. And I thought about how did we get to that? And that's really what the, the idea I want to leave you with uh, in terms of how we did this is we completely reimagined how computing gets done. It's been done a certain way for hundred, nearly 100 years. We, took, we threw that away, we took a clean sheet of paper and we said how would we start if we started today? 
and that led to a completely new platform. And that's what you've got to get done. You've got to help your organizations to reimagine how work gets done, how your business processes work, why they're even needed in many cases, and also how your business model works. And I'll share a couple of examples of what I mean by that right towards the end of the presentation. But that reimagining is really, really hard. You know, you, you're getting a unique opportunity here in a really cool um, environment with like-minded folks to step out of the day-to-day -day round. But generally in business, we're all chasing a target. We've got a project to deliver on time. We've got a budget to make. We've got a new office to open. We've got a new production line to start up. We're heads down focusing on, on today's target or this quarter's target. And it's very, very difficult to step out of that. And that's what we had to do as a technology company. We had to step out of the way computing had always been done and look around us and say, how's this world shifting? And what is gonna be the way to do this in the future? And that led us to the notion of design thinking. Now, some of you are probably already practitioners of design thinking, I hope. Can I have a show of hands? Are any of you design thinking practitioners in here? So there are a handful of you. I would hope in the year's time when you come back, there'll be a whole heap more. But essentially, what does it bring to the table? Because we've always been good at building business cases and understanding the MPV and the internal rate of return and the payback period and the ROI and blah, blah, blah for our business cases of what we do. We've been pretty good at cobbling technology together to get it done. But what we have not often been good at is the empathetic piece, the people piece. And a lot of that obviously is around the discussion of things like gamification. How do we make things and experiences more uh, compelling? So SAP, as an organization, adopted design thinking lock, stock, and barrel. We use it everywhere today. Mostly we use it with our customers to help them disrupt themselves before somebody else comes along and does it to them. And the key thing in here is to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think about how they live their lives. What would work for them? You have to be kind of part anthropologist, part scientist, part psychologist. And one of the things that's really, really important about design thinking is you absolutely have to bring a diverse team to the table. If someone from your department says, come, let's go do design thinking so we can figure out how to serve our organization better, rather go and play golf. Because unless you bring people from inside and outside your organization together into that session, you will never get the insights that you're looking for. It really is about bringing left brain and right brain people together. We have one customer, the breakthrough idea that the board had been, they'd been wrestling a whole day in a session, the breakthrough moment came when they brought the Mexican tea lady into their session. She gave them an insight into what it was like to be one of their customers that they simply couldn't have or would never have had on their own. It's a process. In a nutshell, it's about divergent thinking, creating ideas, opening up a solution space, understanding what the problems are, so problem finding, and then convergent thinking to create solutions. And iterating through that process really, really fast so that you're proto uh, prototyping and experimenting towards the ultimate solution very, very quickly. Here's an example of what it can yield. This new platform I talk about is having a profound impact on any organization that has to deal with massive amounts of data. The old way for this company, trying to understand customer behavior, took 150 hours to run the report. On the new reimagined platform we deliver, it takes two and a half minutes. Here's a company that used design thinking to reimagine completely the very mundane world of running toilets in large institutions like this or hospitals or sports fields or whatever. And what you see on the screen there, which is their digital transformation journey, is a design thinking artifact. This is how you work with design thinking. It's very visual. It's very inclusive. It's about getting the ideas across in a way that anybody can engage with them very, very quickly. We used it, we are using it in Africa. One of the things we want to do is contribute towards a better world and improve people's lives. And if you consider the fact that around about 80% of everybody who works in Africa works in agriculture and a very, very high proportion of them are subsistence farmers who are shut off, <coughs> excuse me, from finance and all sorts of other things, anything we can do to help them has got to be a good thing to bring them into the economy, to help them start to grow their, their, their small businesses. But we didn't want to do 
what so often happens where someone has an idea from outside and an NGO in the States comes in, drops it down, looks good, go away, it falls over. So we worked with the farmers themselves to, to work deeply, deeply understand how they live their lives and what their challenges were to start delivering an application to them that helps them really farm better and get more uh, money w w for their products once they farm them, so sell them more successfully. Disease. The Ebola outbreak was frightening. I was traveling a lot in West Africa at the time, and when someone told me that you could pick it up if someone had sweated on a seat that you sat on, everywhere I went I sat like this for like three, three months. But here we had the challenge of trying to understand where, how that disease spreads and where the resources need to be to, to curb the spread of the disease. And the only thing I want you to take away from this is we didn't do this on our own. If you look at the panel at the bottom there, you'll see we worked with many, many different stakeholders to put together a really elegant solution to support the doctors on the ground very, very quickly so they could understand who had the disease, who they'd been in contact with, how that disease was traveling through the community and where they needed to put resources at the right place at the right time to shut it down. And here's an example of a city where using design thinking, the city of Karlsruhe figured out that, hey, traffic lights, man, there's potential here. These things are laid out in an awesome grid pattern. They're all over the city. Let's start loading them up, not just with lights, but with Wi-Fi repeaters, with emergency buttons for people who might have fallen in the street, with a charging point for, for electrical cars, with environmental sensors. And let's take all of that data and start to make our citizens' lives better in ways that we would never have imagined if someone hadn't opened the solution space up around a light pole using design thinking. So just to conclude, technology is definitely changing the game. For all of us, nobody is immune. Some of you will be closer to the digital vortex than others. If you're in media or retail or banking, you're probably much feeling the heat much more than if you're in mining. But it is changing for everybody. Customers, every time we have a new experience on an app, we want that everywhere in our lives. So we're changing the rules as well. It's changing really, really fast, as I said. You don't have a lot of time left, and nor do I. Um, I think I'm almost on my, on my mark here. My final piece of advice to you, be humble. You will never open yourself up to new ideas if you're arrogant or you think you know it all. Learning starts with humility. Stay curious. Think about things beyond the remit of your immediate job, your immediate organization. Understand where the world is going because you can bring huge value back into your organization. And use design thinking. Bring that as a capability to your organization that will allow your organization to pivot, experiment, and move very, very quickly into a really, really exciting new world. Thanks for listening.